Hi folks, welcome to this video, fourth one on VO2 max. This one is about adaptations to VO2 max. So, once you've done some training, some aerobic endurance based training, what kind of changes will you notice in your body? So we're going to look at the cardiovascular system, adaptations of the cardiovascular system to long distance training, adaptations of the respiratory system, adaptations of the musculoskeletal system, and then what we call metabolic function. So what will actually happen to your metabolism? The, you know, the rate at which you burn calories, etc through training to improve your VO2 max. So I know there's lots of writing, but you know, I just thought I'd get the points up early. You can have a look through them, you can pause the screen, you can have a read, you can have a listen to what I'm saying, my explanations, but it's fairly common sense things. Cardiovascular system is the heart and the blood vessels coming off it. Cardio, heart, vascular, blood vessels. So if you do lots of long distance running, for example, continuous training, fat leg training, you know, the interval training that we spoke about, the uh, high intensity interval training, HIIT training, you're going to get adaptations to your cardiovascular system. You're going to get cardiac hypertrophy. So the heart is going to get bigger and stronger. What does that mean? Well, the volume of blood I can pump out per beat, i.e. my stroke volume, is going to increase. So I'm going to be able to pump out more blood per beat. Now, crucially, that's going to increase at rest. So as you're sitting there chilled out, your heart is pumping out more blood per beat than it used to. As a result, your heart rate, resting heart rate, is going to decrease because your heart doesn't have to beat as often. And, you know, that's common sense, isn't it? You know, we, we, speak, we speak about those, the fittest people have got the lower resting heart rates. The reason their heart rate at rest is low is because their stroke volume is so high that your heart doesn't have to beat as often. I put a term in there, bradycardia. If you've got a resting heart rate of less than 60 beats per minute, you have got what's called bradycardia and that is the sign of a very good healthy heart and it's often called athlete's heart. Next then we've also got increased elasticity of the arterial walls. Now remember the arteries are the blood vessels delivering blood to the muscles away from the heart, arteries away, so towards the muscles. So these are the blood vessels that need to be able to vasodilate and vasoconstrict change blood flow. Vasodilate when I want to increase blood flow to the muscles, vasoconstrict when I want to decrease blood flow to the muscles. So by having better elasticity or increased elasticity, they can vasodilate and vasoconstrict more and more effectively. So that's going to mean better blood flow to the areas that I want to get it, the areas that I want to get the blood to, sorry. Also, what we notice, because you can regulate your blood flow better due to the increased elasticity, you're going to get a lower rest in blood pressure. The, arter the arterial walls are more elastic, less pressure in the blood vessels because they're more elastic, so your blood pressure is going to drop, which again is a sign of good health. Thirdly then, we've got increased blood plasma volume. In other words, pretty much the water that makes up, you know, your blood, that makes your blood a liquid. I'm going to increase the amount of plasma, i.e. water, if you want to think of it that way, inside my blood. So my blood is going to have lower viscosity. Remember, viscosity means thicker or thickness. So if I've got lower blood viscosity, my blood is thinner, it's runnier, it's, it's more like a nice flowing liquid, which means, again, I'm going to get better blood flow, better delivery of oxygen and nutrients to my muscles. I'm also going to get an increase in my red blood cells, our hemoglobin. So I'm going to be able to carry more oxygen, now, don't forget, better gaseous exchange. We're talking about having more red blood cells, being able to carry more oxygen from the lungs so I can pick up more oxygen uh, for, uh, in the blood vessels in the lungs. And then ultimately, with more hemoglobin, I can carry more oxygen to the muscles where I can then diffuse the oxygen into the muscles. So by having more red blood cells, more hemoglobin, I can carry more oxygen, I can diffuse more out of the lungs and diffuse more into the muscles. And finally then for the cardiovascular system, links in with this one, capillarization. I am going to build more capillaries. That's in the lungs, so more capillaries surrounding the alveoli in the lungs, but also more capillaries in type 1 muscle fibres. Remember, type 1 muscle fibres are your slow twitch muscle fibres. They're the ones built for endurance. So if I've got more capillaries in my alveoli and more capillaries in my type 1 muscle fibres, I've got better or greater surface area inside the lungs and inside the muscles and that's again going to lead to better or increased gaseous exchange. So again I'm going to be able to get more oxygen from the lungs and deliver more oxygen and diffuse more oxygen into the muscle tissue. 
So onto the respiratory system then. This one's fairly straightforward, as was the cardiovascular system, but there's only a couple of them this time. Basically, through lots of long distance running, training to improve our VO2 max, we're going to get stronger respiratory muscles. Remember your diaphragm sits under here, okay? And you've got things like intercostals that sit between your ribs, and you've also got your abdominals that also help. So think back about the mechanics of breathing, which muscles are involved in inhalation and exhalation, inspiration or expiration during exercise. You're going to get stronger respiratory muscles, which means deeper breaths in, deeper breaths out, and that's going to increase your maximum lung volume, the amount of uh, maximum air you can get in and out of your lungs. Also, you're going to actually increase the surface area of alveoli within the lungs. So remember when we looked at gaseous exchange, the alveoli with the capillaries wrapped around them, you're going to increase the number of alveoli in your lungs, which means more opportunity for diffusion. So you're going to increase the amount of um, external respiration. Remember, external respiration takes place at the lungs, internal respiration takes place at the muscles. And we're talking about the respiratory system here. So we're increasing the amount of external respiration by getting stronger respiratory muscles and increased surface area of alveoli. Onto the musculoskeletal system then. Yes, there's a lot more. Calm down, don't panic. Just think about this logically, right? We're dealing with all the muscles of the body, the musculoskeletal system. So what are the adaptations of the muscles and the bones and associated structures through doing lots of long distance running? Well, I'm going to get hypertrophy of muscles, but which ones in particular? Type 1, slow oxidative. So you're slow to which muscle fibres. So, and you know, the characteristics of these muscle fibres are that they can work longer without fatiguing and they can produce more energy aerobically because they've got greater mitochondria and greater numbers of myoglobin and things like that, greater capillaries. So I'm going to get an increase in hypertrophy of this type of muscle fibre. But that leads me into my next point. Within these muscle fibres, I'm going to get increased size and density of mitochondria. And remember, they are the mitochondria, they are the power stations of uh, the muscle cells in aerobic um, exercise. So they, um, they produce lots of energy using oxygen, which is exactly what I'm doing when I'm long distance running. So I'm going to produce more aerobic energy and I'm going to be able to break down more fat because I can only break down fat when I am working aerobically as well. I'm also going to increase my myoglobin levels so I can store more oxygen in the muscles. Now here's one that confuses people. You're going to increase your glycogen and fat stores. Now you might be thinking, I, I don't want to increase my fat stores. I want that's the point. That's you know, one of the reasons why people do a lot of running is, is to decrease fat stores. These are the fat stores around your belly and things like that. These are the fat stores within the muscle fibers, like tiny droplets of what we call triglycerides that exist dotted around the body. The reason they're in the muscles is because you can break fat down in the mitochondria. So I've got more mitochondria to produce the energy, and I've also got more fat stores located near. The mitochondria as well as glycogen so i've got more fuel ready to use inside the muscle so these are stores of glycogen and fat within the muscle tissue not under the skin around the abdomen around the bone around the thighs things like that coming on to the skeletal system a bit more you're going to get increased air cartilage thickness so you're going to have greater absorbency of impact you know particularly around the you know the knee joints and things like that and better joint protection you're also going to have better movement if the cartilage is thicker there's more synovial fluid there, the joint's better lubricated, you're going to get better movement there. But don't forget about these things. Musculoskeletal system, ligaments hold bones to bones and tendons hold muscles to bones. So they're all, look. The, both of these are located around the joints because obviously a joint is where two or more bones meet and where they meet they've got to join and it's ligaments doing the joining and the muscles generally attack around joints. So the tendons and ligaments are both located around the joints so that's going to lead to better joint stability, stronger tendons, stronger ligaments. You're going to have more stable joints. And finally, the bones itself, you're going to have increased bone density. You're going to put more calcium into your bones. So these bones are going to have greater strength and a decreased risk of injury, such as fractures. So finally, then metabolic function, our metabolism. You know, there's a muscle cell, there's a blood vessel delivering fuel and things like that to the muscle. So we're talking about the rate at which we're burning calories and things like that. Well, aerobic enzymes, enzymes speed up reactions of things. So what aerobic enzyme does is it speeds up the breakdown of fat and glycogen. So I can get the energy from those two fuels quicker. If I increase the number of aerobic enzymes, I can break fats and glycogen down quicker. I can get the energy from them quicker. As all of that, if I can break down fats quicker, 
I'm going to have decreased fat mass, so I'm not going to carry as much fat mass around my abdomen, around my glutes, around my thighs, things like that. Because we're going to have an increased metabolic rate. We're breaking it down quicker under the action of the enzymes. That's more calories burnt, and that is ultimately better weight management. And finally, decreased insulin resistance. The job of insulin is when you eat something sugary, high in glucose, insulin is released to try and bring the blood sugar levels down in your blood to a controllable level by turning some of that glucose into glycogen. Remember, glycogen is stored glucose. So we can save that for later on. People who have diabetes have high insulin resistance. The blood sugar stays elevated uh, and that can cause problems. You know, they go hyperglycemic. They have a lot of issues related to that. So we're doing lots of aerobic endurance training. We decrease our insulin resistance. We can tolerate glucose better and we reduce our risk of diabetes. So there, that's how training to improve VO2 max has impacts on those key major body systems. Hope you found this video useful, folks.